Good day, ENG1P1. Miss Boschkoff here. We're going to get right into section four of our novel study, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. And the uh, we're going to start with the study questions here. Again, that's chapters 11 to 15. The study, yeah, the study guide um, poses some questions. Now, again, if you do not have the study guide, all you need to do is just copy out the questions on a fresh sheet of paper and you can still participate. You don't need the study guide. So please just pay attention as we go through. So I'm going to be giving you some sentence starters and some really, really big hints here for the for, for these questions for this section. So again, we're going to try to remember to read the questions before we actually read the text. And this is a time saving strategy that we're going to try to remember to use on the OSSLT next year. The uh, Ontario Secondary School Literacy Test. If you can just remember to read the questions first, it is a time-saving strategy in that you will, um, your brain will already have some prior knowledge about what information to look for. So again, and it can save you some really good time. Chapter 16 called Rowdy Gives Me Advice About Love. Question number one. Why does Junior refer to how white Penelope is? And what is the effect of this? Now remember, we said we're gonna try and answer these questions using APE, which is answer, prove, extend. For the answer part, you're gonna take part of the question and put it in your answer. For the prove part, you're gonna to try to include a quote from the text. And then the extension part, you're gonna to have to explain a little more. Now, if there is a second question, that second question you can use as the E part. So if we were gonna label this, we would say, there's our A and there's our E. The P part, of course, goes right here. That is the proof part. So um, Junior refers to how white Penelope is because she is so different from him. So it's a contrast to him. It shows how they come from different worlds, right? Like we can even write that in there different worlds. Um, and two quotes for support here. Her skin was pale white, milky white, cloud white from page 114. And she was all white on white, like the most perfect of vanilla dessert cake you've ever seen. So again, uh, quotes here, two proofs that back up this answer. Now again, we said, if there's a second question, you can use that as the extension. The effect of this is that she appears perfect. It shows that Junior thinks her whiteness makes her more beautiful. And as we're reading through the text, we're going to consider this question. Does that mean that Junior is somewhat racist himself? Okay, let's keep going here. Chapter 17, Dance, Dance, Dance. Why is the novel called The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian? So I've highlighted this because this is the part that I want you to focus on. Why is it a part-time Indian and not like a full-time Indian? So the novel is called The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian because Arnold feels like being Indian is his part-time job. Now, we're gonna encounter some quotes here from the text and you're gonna to have to fig figure that out, right? We don't have a second question here. So for this extension, you're gonna to have to make it up on your own. All right, so I'm giving you lots of hints here near the beginning. These are a little bit more difficult questions though, which is why I'm doing that. Chapter 18, don't trust your computer. What does Gordy say about the role of the tribe and how does this apply to Junior's situation? So what is a tribe? Well, all a tribe is, is like a little community that you belong to because you share something in common with them. So maybe you all belong to Hammersholt High School and that's your tribe. Or you all are basketball players and that's your tribe. So just as long as you have something in common, you can say you have you have your own little tribe. Now, at the end here, there is a second question. So this can be the, the E part, right? So we'll label this as A and this as our E. And again, for the P part, we need uh, quotes, quotes for, for support, right? For proof. All right, so what does Gordy say about the role of the tribe? Well, again, huge hint here. Gordy says that the role of the tribe is for safety. 
protection against predators, there's one quote, and against starvation, quote number two. You're gonna to have to fill out this second, or sorry, this third part. This applies to junior situation because, and I certainly give you some big hints here, um, his tribe at the res doesn't keep him safe and fed, but the tribe at Reardon does. They are filled with more hope, right? Which is, of course, the reason why he went to Reardon. He decided to go there. Chapter 19, my sister sends me a letter. Question one, what does Junior think of Mary's gorgeous new place? So again, just one question here. Um, so you're gonna have to come up with your own extension, but you need to take part of the question and put it in your answer. What does Junior think of Mary's gorgeous new place? Junior thinks Mary's gorgeous new place is. And as we read through the text, we'll give you a bunch of clues. All right, so let's head on over to the text. Again, this is chapters 16 to 20. Have you ever watched a beautiful woman pay, play basketball, sorry, play volleyball? Yesterday during a game, Penelope was serving the ball and I watched her like she was a work of art. Yeah, he's got a huge crush on her, right? Now the thing to note here is, uh, this is not the sanitized version of Arnold's experience. It is the absolutely true experience. Therefore, some of the comments he makes may seem a bit shocking, but again, they're shocking because they represent the true thoughts of the character. And again, sometimes you might be offended, uh, sometimes you might think the comments are inappropriate, but again, it's because it's not a sanitized version, it is the absolutely true version. So Arnold is going to share some comments here that um, are a bit, I don't know, maybe might be a bit inappropriate. But again, these are the thoughts that he, the character was really having. So yesterday during a game, Penelope was serving the ball and I watched her like she was a work of art. She was wearing a white shirt and white shorts and I could see the outlines of her white bra and white panties. So again, a little bit shocking, a little bit inappropriate. But again, these are the true, absolutely true thoughts of the character. Her skin was pale white, milky white, cloud white. She was all white on white, like the most perfect kind of vanilla dessert cake you've ever seen. So like she was the epitome of white. She was like the definition of what white is. Um, and here we have some contrast. I wanted to be her chocolate topping. Okay, so why does Junior refer to how white Penelope is? Again, uh, there's lots of contrast here. She lives in a completely different world than he does. What is the effect of this? Well, the effect of it is that, um, where did I put that? Is for contrast, right? To help us understand that he is living in a completely different world than she is. She is... Um, like the definition of what beauty is. And again, the fact that he's focused so much on her whiteness makes you wonder if, if he's kind of racist, right? Against his own tribe, against his own people. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more as this story continues. She was serving against the mean girls from Davenport, Lady Gorillas. Yeah, you read that correctly. They willingly called themselves the Lady Gorillas. And they played like super strong primates too. Penelope and her teammates were getting killed. The score was like 12 to 0 in the first set. But I didn't care. I just wanted to watch the sweaty Penelope sweat her perfect sweat on that perfectly sweaty day. Again, he's got a huge crush on her, right? She's perfect in every way. She stood at the service line, bounced the volleyball a few times to get her rhythm, then tossed it into the air above her head. She tracked the ball with her blue eyes, just watched it intensely. Like that volleyball mattered more than anything else in the world. I got jealous of that ball. I wished I were that ball. As the ball floated in the air, Penelope twisted her hips and back and swung her right arm back over her shoulder, coiling uh, like a really pretty snake. Her leg muscles were stretched and taut, like, like very stiff almost. I almost fainted when she served. 
using all of that twisting and flexing and concentration, she smashed the ball and aced the lady gorillas. And then Penelope clenched a fist and shouted, yes, absolutely gorgeous. Even though I didn't think I'd ever hear back, I wanted to know what to do with my feelings. So I walked over to the computer lab and emailed Rowdy. Now again, remember, Rowdy is his best friend back on the reserve. They left on not very good terms, right? They got into a fight. Um, he's had the same address for five years. Hey, Rowdy, I wrote. I'm in love with a white girl. What should I do? A few minutes later, Rowdy wrote back. Hey, asshole, Rowdy wrote back. I'm sick of Indian guys who treat white women like bowling tro trophies. Get a life. Rowdy, obviously not impressed. Well, that didn't do me any good, so I asked Gordy what I should do about Penelope. I'm an Indian boy, I said. How do I get a white girl to love me? Let me do some research on that, Gordy said. A few days later, he gave me a brief report. Hey, Arnold, he said, I looked up in love with a white girl on Google and found an article about that white girl named Cynthia who disappeared in Mexico last summer. You remember how her face was all over the papers and everybody said it was such a sad thing? Yeah, I kind of remember, I said. Well, this article said that over 200 Mexican girls have disappeared in the last three years in that same area or part of the country. And nobody says much about that. And that's racist. The guy who wrote the article says people care more about beautiful white girls than they do about everybody else on the planet. White girls are privileged. They're damsels in distress. So what does that mean? I asked. I think it means you're just as racist, just a racist asshole like everybody else. Wow. In his own way, Gordy the bookworm was just as tough as Rowdy. Yeah, so, so like dug in deep with his with his words right now we're talking about um, the last couple days about George Floyd who was murdered in Minneapolis and how this was a racial issue with the police or possibly a racial issue with the police um, do we really think that Arnold is racist because he thinks Penelope's whiteness makes her more beautiful in a way you could argue that he is definitely being influenced by society and the fact that our society um, very wrongly um, suggests that if you're white, you have more um, prominence or um, some, some people suggest that if you're white, you have more beauty than people of other races, which of course isn't true, but the media often presents it that way. So is he really a racist? I'm not sure that he's racist, but he is influenced by society for sure. So here we have a picture, of course, of Gordy reading a book and getting very excited about it. All right, chapter 17. Dance, dance, dance. Traveling between Reardon and Well Pennant, between the little white town and the reservation, I always felt like a stranger. I was half Indian in one place and half white in the other. So I'm going to actually highlight that, uh, that statement there because it helps you answer, sorry, it helps you answer one of the questions in the study package. The question is, why is the novel called The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian? Well, this question would be a really good, sorry, this quote would be a really good quote to support your answer. Why is he a part-time Indian? because he feels like he's half Indian in one place and half white in the other. And then here's another good quote for support. It was like being Indian was my job, but it was only a part-time job and it didn't pay well, well at all. The only person who made me feel great all the time was Penelope. Well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, my mother and father were working hard for me too. They were constantly scraping together enough money to pay for gas, to get me lunch money, and to buy me a new pair of jeans and a few new, a few new shirts. My parents gave me just enough money so that I could pretend to have more money than I did. I lied about how poor I was. Everybody in Reardon assumed we Spokans 
so this is the Indians or the indigenous people from the Spokane region made lots of money because we had a casino. But that casino, mismanaged and too far away from major highways, was a money losing business. In order to make money from the casino, you had to work at the casino. And white people everywhere have always believed that the government just gives money to Indians. And since the kids and parents at Reardon thought I had a lot of money, I did nothing to change their minds. So he's pretending to be more rich than he actually is. I figured it wouldn't do me any good if they knew I was dirt poor. Now remember how poor he actually is. They're so poor that they couldn't even save his best friend, his dog, Oscar. They didn't have money for the vet. What would they think of me if they knew I sometimes had to hitchhike to school? Yeah, so I pretended to have a little money. I pretended to be middle class. I pretended I belonged. Nobody knew the truth. Of course, you can't lie forever. Lies have short shelf lives. Lies go bad. Lies rot and stink up the joint. Yeah. So my mother used to say lies have short legs. They can't get very far um, without people finding out the truth. So this is going to be a story, obviously, about some people finding out the truth about him lying. In December, I took Penelope to the winter formal. The thing is, I only had $5. Not nearly enough to pay for anything. Not for photos, not for food, not for gas, not for a hot dog and soda pop. If it had been any other dance, a regular dance, I would have stayed home with an imaginary illness, but I couldn't skip winter formal. And I didn't take Penelope, and if I didn't take Penelope, then she would have certainly gone with somebody else. How to pretend you're not poor. No lunch money. Oh, I'm not hungry anyway. Grumble. Field trip, school dance? No, I can't make it. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sick. Cough, cough. Bake sale? Mm, looks yummy, but Native Americans are allergic to sugar. Everyone has the latest iPad. Oh, I'm old school. A good all-purpose excuse. There's this Indian ceremony at home. Oh man, we'll miss you. So again, he's making up all these excuses so that people don't know how poor they really are. They're so poor, they had to shoot their dog, Oscar, because they couldn't afford the veterinarian bills. Because I didn't have money for gas and because I couldn't have driven the car if I wanted to, and because I didn't uh, want to double date, I told Penelope I'd meet her at the gym for the dance. She wasn't too happy about that. But the worst thing is that I had to wear one of my dad's old suits. So me as unintentional disco freak. Note, tie his polka dots and stripes. Dad bought this suit in the 1970s. Rust colored, polyester, delightfully scratchy and hot. Bell bottoms, of course. So again, this suit is very much out of style. I was worried that people would make fun of me, right? And they probably would have if Penelope hadn't immediately squealed with delight when she first saw me walk into the gym. Oh my God, she yelled for everybody to hear. That suit is so beautiful. It's so retroactive. It's so retroactive that it's radioactive. And every dude in the joint immediately wished he'd worn his father's lame polyester suit. And if I imagine that every girl was immediately breathless and horny at the sight of my bell-bottom slacks. So drunk with my sudden power, I pulled off some lame disco dance moves that sent the place into hysterics. Even Roger, the huge dude I'd punched in the face, was suddenly my buddy. Penelope and I were so happy to be alive and so happy to be alive together, even if we were only uh, a semi-hot item and we danced every single, every single dance. 19 dances, 19 songs, 12 fast songs, seven slow ones. 11 country hits, five rock hits, three hip hop tunes. It was the best night of my life. Of course, I was a sweaty mess inside that hot polyester suit, but it didn't matter. Penelope thought I was beautiful and so I felt beautiful. 
And then the dance was over. The lights flicked on. And Penelope suddenly realized we'd forgotten to get our picture taken by the professional dude. Oh my God, she yelled. We forgot to get our pictures taken. That sucks. She was sad for a moment. But then she realized that she'd had so much fun that a photograph of the evening was completely beside the point. A photograph would have just been a lame souvenir. I was completely relieved that we'd forgotten. I wouldn't have been able to pay for the photographs, and I knew that. And I'd rehearsed a speech about losing my wallet. I'd made it through the evening without revealing my poverty. I figured I'd walk Penelope out to the parking lot where her dad was waiting for her in his car. I'd give her a sweet little kiss on the cheek because her dad would have shot me if I'd even if I'd given her the tongue while he watched. And then I'd wave goodbye as they drove away. And then I'd wait in the parking lot until everybody was gone. And then I'd start the walk home in the dark. It was a Saturday, so I knew some reservation family would be picking, would be, sorry, would be returning home from Spokane. And I knew they'd see me and pick me up. That was the plan. But things changed, as things always change. Roger and a few of the other dudes, the popular guys, decided they were going to drive into Spokane and have pancakes at some 24-hour diner. It was suddenly the coolest idea in the world. It was all seniors and juniors, upper-class men, who were going together. But Penelope was so popular, especially for a freshman, and I was popular by association, even as a freshman too, that Roger invited us to come along. Penelope was ecstatic about the idea. I was sick to my stomach. I had five bucks in my pocket. What could I buy with that? Maybe one plate of pancakes? Maybe. I was doomed. The pancakes of doom. Butter of shame, syrup of regret. So again, feeling like he's not good enough, right? Low self-esteem. What do you say, Arnie? Roger asked. You want to come carbo load with us? What do you want to do, Penelope? I asked. Oh, I want to go. I want to go, she said. Let me go ask Daddy. Oh, man, I saw my only escape. I could only hope that Earl wouldn't let her go. Only Earl could save me now. I was counting on Earl. That's how bad my life was at that particular moment. Penelope skipped over toward her father's car. Hey, Pentultimate, Roger said. I'll go with you. I'll tell Earl you guys are riding with me, and I'll drive you guys home. Roger's nickname for Penelope was Penta Ultimate. Like ultimate, like she's the ultimate. It was maybe the biggest word he knew. I hated that he, that he had a nickname for her. And as they walked together toward Earl, I realized that Roger and Penelope looked good together. They looked natural. They looked like they should be a couple. And after they found out, and after they all found out I was a poor ass Indian, I knew they would be a couple. Come on, Earl, come on, Earl. Break your daughter's heart. But Earl loved Roger. Every dad loved Roger. He was the best football player they'd ever seen. Of course, they loved him. It would have been un-American not to love the best football player. I imagined that Earl said his daughter could only go if Roger got his hands into her panties instead of me. Again, this is not a sanitized version. It's the real truth of what he's thinking, right? I was angry and jealous and absolutely terrified. I can go, I can go, Penelope said. Ran back to me and hugged me hard. An hour later, about 20 of us were sitting in a Denny's in Spokane. Everybody ordered pancakes. I ordered pancakes for, Nel for Penelope and me. I ordered orange juice and coffee and a side order of toast and hot chocolate and french fries too. Even though I knew I wouldn't be able to pay for any of it. I figured it was my last meal before my execution and I was going to have to have a feast and I was going to have a feast. Halfway through our meal, I went to the bathroom. I thought maybe I was going to throw up. So I kneeled at the toilet, but I only retched a bit. Roger came into the bathroom and heard me. Hey, Arnie, he said, are you okay? Yeah, I said, I'm just tired. All right, man, he said, 
I'm happy you guys came tonight. You and Pent Ultimate are a great couple, man. You think so? Yeah. Have you done her yet? I don't really want to talk about that stuff. Yeah, you're right, dude. It's none of my business. Hey, man, are you going to try it for, for basketball? I knew that practice started in a week. I planned on playing, but I didn't know if Coach liked Indians or not. Yeah, I said. Are you any good? Uh, I'm okay. You think you're good enough to play varsity? Roger asked. No way, I said. I'm junior varsity all the way. All right, Roger said. It'll be good to have you out there. We need some new blood. Thanks, man, I said. I couldn't believe he was so nice. He was, well, he was polite. How many great football players are polite and kind and generous like that? It was amazing. Hey, listen, I said. The reason I was getting sick in there is I thought about telling him the whole truth, but I just couldn't. I bet you're just sick with love, Roger said. No, well, yeah, maybe, I said. But the thing is, my stomach is all messed up because I, er, forgot my wallet. I left my, my money at home, man. Dude, Roger said. Man, don't sweat it. You should have said something earlier. I got you covered. He opened his wallet and handed me 40 bucks. Holy, holy. What kind of kid can just hand over 40 bucks like that? I'll pay you back, man, I said. Whatever, man. Just have a good time, all right? He slapped me on the back again. He was always slapping me on the back. We walked back to the table together, finished our food, and Roger drove me back to the school. I told them my dad was going to pick me up outside the gym. Dude, Roger said, it's three in the morning. It's okay, I said. My dad works the swing shift. He's coming here straight from work. Are you sure? Yeah, everything's cool. I'll bring Pentultimate home safely, man. Cool. So Penelope and I got out of the car so we could have a private goodbye. She had laser eyes. Roger told me he lent you some money, she said. Uh, yeah, I said. I, I forgot my wallet. Her laser eyes grew hotter. Arnold? Yeah? Can I ask you something big? Yeah, I guess. Are you poor? I couldn't lie to her anymore. Yes, I said. I'm poor. I figured she was going to march right out of my life right then. But she didn't. Instead, she kissed me. On the cheek. I guess poor guys don't get kissed on the lips. I was going to yell at her. I was going to yell at her for being shallow. But then I realized that she was being my friend. Being a really good friend, in fact. She was concerned about me. I'd been thinking about her breasts. And she'd been thinking about my whole life. I was the shallow one. Roger was the one who guessed you were poor, she said. Oh, great. Now he's going to tell everybody. He's not going to tell anybody. Roger likes you. He's a great guy. He's like my big brother. He can be your friend, too. That sounded pretty good to me. I needed friends more than I needed my lust-filled dreams. Is your dad really coming to pick you up, she asked. Yes, I said. Are you telling the truth? No, I said. Are you poor? Possible responses. No. Yes. Poor. Do you mean like I have pores? Yes, I have many. Trying to make a joke out of it. Well, poverty is a relative thing. Historical theoreticians believe that when you define a certain income as opposed to output, statistics are skewed. Uh, allow me to digress. So distracting. And then gasp over the, over, look over there, and then runs away. Again, just like running away as a coward instead of answering the question. How will you get home? She asked. Most nights, I walk home. I hitchhike. Somebody usually picks me up. I've only had to walk the whole way a few times. She started to cry. For me. Who knew that tears of sympathy could be so sexy? Oh my God, Arnold, you can't do that, she said. I won't let you do that. You'll freeze. Roger will drive you home. He'll be happy to drive you home. I tried to stop her, but Penelope ran over to Roger's car and told him the truth. And Roger being a, 
um, being a kind heart and generous pocket and a little bit racist, drove me home that night. And he drove me home plenty of other nights too. If you let people into your life a little bit, they can be pretty damn amazing. Okay, so again, he's learning here that his tribe at Reardon do protect him and they do feed him, which again is what Gordy says is the whole purpose of a tribe. But his tribe back on the res, unfortunately for him, don't, right? His parents do, but not the rest of them. Chapter 18, don't trust your computer. Today at school, I was really missing Rowdy, so I walked over to the computer lab, took a digital photo of my smiling face, and emailed it to him. A few minutes later, he emailed me a digital photo of his bare ass. I don't know when he snapped that pic. It made me laugh, and it made me depressed too. Rowdy could be so crazy, funny, disgusting. The Reardon kids were so worried about grades and sports and their futures that they sometimes acted like repressed middle-aged business dudes with cell phones stuck in their small intestines. Rowdy was the opposite of repressed. He was exactly the kind of kid who would email his bare ass and bare everything else to the world. Hey, Gordy said, is that somebody's posterior? Posterior? Did he just say posterior? So posterior is another word for, you know, like meaning bum or buttock, right? Gordy, my man, I said, that is most definitely not a posterior. That is a stinky ass. You can smell the thing even through the computer. Whose butt is that, he asked. Oh, it's my best friend, Rowdy. Well, he used to be my best friend. He hates me now. How come he hates you? He asked. Because I left the res, I said. But you still live there, don't you? You're just going to school here. I know, I know. But some Indians think you have to act white to make your life better. Some Indians think you have to become white if you... Sorry, some Indians think you become white if you try to make your life better. If you become successful. Well, if that were true then wouldn't all white people be successful? Man, Gordy was smart. I wished I could take him to the res and let him educate Rowdy. Of course, Rowdy would probably punch Gordy until he was brain dead, or maybe Rowdy, Gordy, and I could come, uh, sorry, could become superhero, a superhero trio, fighting for truth, justice, and the Native American way. Well, okay, Gordy was white. But anybody can start to act like an Indian if he hangs around us long enough. The people at home, I said, a lot of them call me an apple. Do they think you're a fruit or something? He asked. No, no, I said. They call me an apple because they think I'm red on the outside and white on the inside. Ah, uh, so they think you're a traitor. Yep. Well, life is a constant struggle between being an individual and being a member of the community. So now we're going to see that Gordy gets into this whole idea of uh, the whole purpose of a community and the role of the tribe right here. Can you believe that there is a kid who talks like that? Like he's already a college professor, impressed with the sound of his own voice? Gordy, I said, I don't understand what you're trying to say to me. Well... In the early days of humans, the community was our only protection against predators and against starvation. Okay, so here's the role of the tribe for safety, right? Against predators and against starvation. We survived because we trusted one another. So? So back in the day, weird people threatened the strength of the tribe. If you weren't good for making food, shelter, or babies, you were tossed out on your own. Now, this is really true. People were ostracized if they were, you know, different. Sorry, just a drink of water there. But we're not primitive uh, like that anymore. Oh, yes, we are. Weird people still get banished. You mean weird people like me, I said. And me, Gordy said. All right, then, I said. 
So we have a tribe of two. So remember I said in order to be a tribe, you have to have something in common. So what Arnold says here is true. They're both kind of weird and a little bit banished, right, from mainstream. So they could be a tribe of two of, of weird people. I had the sudden urge to hug Gordy, and he had the sudden urge to prevent me from hugging him. Don't get sentimental, he said. Yep, even the weird boys are afraid of their emotions. So again, role of the tribe to keep members safe and to keep each other from starving. Again, we see here that the tribe of the Reardon kids definitely do do this, right? They are keeping Arnold safe driving him home and, you know, lending him money. Um, and they are keeping each other from starving, right? Like he lends him money so that he can eat and things like that. Um, so again, here's the role of the tribe. It's kind of ironic for Arnold because his tribe on the res doesn't keep him safe or fed, right? Versus his tribe at Reardon and how they do keep him safe and fed. Again, it just shows that Reardon kids have more hope. Chapter 19. My sister sends me a letter. Dear Junior, I am still looking for a job. They keep telling me I don't have enough experience, but how can I get enough experience if they don't give me a chance to get experience? Oh well. I have a lot of free time, so I've started to write my life story. Really? Isn't that crazy? I think I'm going to call it How to Run Away from Your House and Find Your Home. What do you think? Tell everybody I love them and miss them. Love your big sis. P.S. And we moved into a new house. It's the most gorgeous place in the world. So here is the cartoon, of course, that Junior draw, uh, draws about her gorgeous new place. Um, and he mentions that it looks like a TV dinner tray. Yeah, because it probably looks like tinfoil on the outside. It's silver. And she is saying it's the most beautiful, gorgeous place in the world. But according to Arnold, it's not. He, he's not really agreeing with her, right? It doesn't look that gorgeous. It looks like, like something cheap, like a TV dinner tray. Okay, so Reindeer Games. Here's our last uh, chapter in this section. I almost didn't try out for Reardon, for the Reardon basketball team. I just figured I wasn't going to be good enough to even make the C squad. And I didn't want to get cut from the team. I didn't think I could live through that humiliation. But my dad changed my mind. Do you know about the first time I met your mother? He asked. You're both from the res, I said. So it was on the res, big duh. But I only moved to this res when I was five years old. So? So your mother is eight years older than me. And there's a partridge in a pear tree. Get to the point, Dad. Your mother was 13 and I was five when we first met. And guess how we first met? How? She helped me get a drink from the water fountain. Well, that seems sort of gross, I said. I was tiny, Dad said. And she boosted me up so I could get a drink. And imagine, all these years later... And we're married and have two kids. What does this have to do with basketball? You have to dream big to get big. That's pretty dang optimistic for you, Dad. Well, you know, your mother helped me get a drink from the water fountain last night, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Again, kind of inappropriate, but it's the absolutely true story, right? And all I could say to my father was, ew, uh, that's one more thing people don't know about Indians. We love to talk dirty. Anyway, I signed up for basketball. On the first day of practice, I stepped onto the court and felt short, skinny, and slow. So again, he feels like, like he does have low self-esteem, right? Sorry, I'm just moving on my chair here. All of the white boys were good. Some were great. I mean, there were some guys who were six foot six and six foot seven. Roger the Giant was strong and fast and could dunk. I tried to stay out of the way. I figured I'd die if he ran if he ran me over. But he just smiled all the time, played hard and slapped me on the back. Hard on the back. We all shot basketballs for a while 
And then Coach stepped onto the court. Listen up, voice like Thor, huge lips, skull, so he's doing chewing tobacco here. Um, maybe five inches, that's pretty short for an adult. Skinny, 2% body fat, uh, the same shorts regardless of the weather. Hairless old man legs. Okay, so this is his coach. 40 kids immediately stopped bouncing and shooting and talking. We were silent, just snap, just like that. I want to thank you all for coming out today, coach said. There are 40 of you, but we, can, we only have room for 12 on the varsity and 12 on the junior varsity. So I guess that's 24. Yeah, 12 and 12, 24. I knew I wouldn't make those teams. I was C squad meat, sorry, material for sure. In other years, we've also had a 12 man C squad, coach said, but we don't have the budget for it this year. That means I'm gonna have to cut 16 players today. 20 boys puffed up their chests. They knew they were good enough to make either the varsity or the junior varsity. The other 20 shook their heads. We knew we were cuttable. I really hate to do this, coach said. If it were up to me, I'd keep everybody. So this is actually some character delineation about the coach. He seems like a good guy. If he really means this, that's pretty fair of him. But it's not up to me. So we're just going to have to do our best here, okay? You play with dignity and respect, and I'll treat you with dignity and respect, no matter what happens, all right? So again, he seems like a pretty good guy. I hope he means it, right? We all agreed to that. Okay, let's get started, Coach said. The first drill was a marathon. Well, not exactly a marathon. We had to run 100 laps around the gym, so 40 of us ran, and 36 of us finished. After 50 laps, one guy quit, and since quitting is contagious, three other boys caught the disease and walked off the, cart, the court too. I didn't understand. Why would you try out for, basket, for the basketball team if you didn't want to run? I didn't mind. After all, that meant only 12 more guys had to be cut. I only had to be better than 12 other guys. Well, we were all good and tired after that run. And then coach immediately had us playing full court, one-on-one. -on -one. That's right, full court, one-on-one. -on -one. That was torture. Coach didn't break it down by position, so quick guards had to guard power forwards and vice versa. Seniors had to guard freshmen and vice versa. All-stars had to guard losers like me and vice versa. Coach threw me the ball and said, go. So I turned and dribbled straight down the court. A mistake. Roger easily poked the ball away and raced down toward uh, his basket. Ashamed, I was frozen. What are you waiting for, coach asked me. Play some D. Awake, I ran after Roger, but he dunked it before I was even close. Go again, coach said. Coach said. This time, Roger tried to dribble down the court and I played defense. I crouched down low, spread my arms and legs wide, sorry, high and wide, and gritted my teeth. And then Roger ran over me, sorry, ran me over, just, uh, just sent me sprawling. He raced down and dunked it again while I lay still on the floor. Coach walked over and looked down at me. What's your name, kid? He asked. Arnold, I said. You from the reservation? Yes. Did you play basketball up there? Yes, for the eighth grade team. Coach studied my face. I remember you, he said. You were a good shooter. Yeah, I said. Coach studied my face some more, as if he were searching for something. Roger's a big kid, he said. <clears throat> He's huge, I said. You want to take him on again, or do you need a break? 90% of me wanted to take the break, but I knew if I took that break, I would never make the team. I'll take him on again, <clears throat> I said. Coach smiled. All right, Roger, he said. Line up again. I stood up again. Coach threw me the ball and Roger came for me. He screamed and laughed like a crazy man. He was having a great time and he was trying to intimidate me. He did intimidate me. 
I dribbled with my right hand toward Roger, knowing he was going to try to steal the ball. If he stayed in front of me and reached for the ball with his left hand, then there was no way I could get past him. He was too big and strong, too immovable. But he reached for the ball with his right hand, and that put him uh, a little off balance. So I spun and dribbled around him, did a 360, and raced down the court. He was right behind me. I thought I could outrun him, but he caught up to me and just blasted me. He just skittled, skittling, sorry. He just, just me skittle, skittling across the floor again. The ball went bouncing into the stands. I should have stayed down, but I didn't. Instead, I jumped up, ran into the stands, grabbed the loose ball, and raced towards Roger, standing beneath the basket. I didn't even dribble, uh, sorry, dribble. I just ran like a fullback. Roger crouched, ready to tackle me like he was a middle linebacker. He screamed, I screamed. And then I stopped short, about 15 feet from the hoop, and I made a pretty little jump shot. Everybody in the gym yelled and clapped and stomped their feet. Roger was mad at first, but then he smiled, grabbed the ball, and dribbled toward his hoop. He spun left, right, but I stayed with him. He bumped me, pushed me, and elbowed me, but I stayed with him. He went up for a layup, but I fouled him. But if I'd, lear if I'd learned there, there are no fouls called in full court one-on-one, uh, but I'd learned, sorry, but I'd learned there are no fouls called in full court one-on-one. -on -one. So I grabbed the loose ball and raced for my end again. But coach blew the whistle. All right, all right, Arnold, Roger, coach said. That's good, that's good. Next two, next two. I took my place at the, at the back of the line and Roger stood next to me. Good job, he said, and offered his fist. I bumped his fist with mine. I was a warrior feeling pretty good about himself. And that's when I knew I was going to make the team. Heck, I ended up on the varsity as a freshman. Coach said I was the best shooter who'd ever played for him. And I was going to be his secret weapon. I was going to be his weapon of mass destruction. Coach sure loved those military metaphors. Okay, so here he is, right? The best shooter ever played for him. Um, his secret weapon, his weapon of mass destruction. So I'm going to get you to remember this point that the coach thinks <clears throat> that he is the secret weapon. And we're going to see why. I just need a drink of water here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> two weeks later, we traveled up the road for our first game of the season. And our first game was against Well Pennant High School. So this high school is the high school that Arnold Jr. used to go to on the res. So this is the res school, Well Pennant. I'll just write that on there. Res, yeah. <clears throat> yep, it was like something out of Shakespeare. Uh, the morning of the game, I'd woken up in my res house so my dad could drive me the 22 miles to Reardon so I could get on the bus, the team bus for the ride back to the reservation. <sighs> Crazy. Do I have to tell you that I was absolutely sick with fear? I vomited four times that day. When our bus pulled into the high school parking lot, we were greeted by some rabid elementary school kids. Some of those little dudes and dudettes were my cousins. They pelted our bus with snowballs and some of those snowballs were filled with rocks. Yeah, not nice. Not, not very um, um, friendly, that's for sure. As we got off the school bus, sorry, off the bus and walked toward the gym, I could hear the crowd going crazy inside. They were chanting something. I, I couldn't make it out. And then I could. The res basketball chant fans were chanting, Arnold sucks. Arnold sucks. Arnold sucks. They weren't calling me by my res name, Junior. Nope. They were calling me by my Reardon name. So again, remember, the people on the res think he's a traitor, right? So they're calling him by his, his um, Reardon name. They think he's an apple, right? Red on the outside and white on the inside. I stopped. Coach looked back at me. 
Are you okay? He asked. No, I said. You don't have to play this one, he said. Oh, yes, I do, I said. Now, this is interesting. He is not a racist, and this is important to note that the coach has Arnold's back, right? He is a caring person. Uh, still, I probably, w I probably would have turned around if I hadn't seen my mom and dad and grandma waiting at the front door. I knew they'd, they'd, been, uh, they'd been pitched just as much crap as I was, and there they were, ready to catch more crap for me, ready to walk through the crap with me. Yeah, because people on the res must have been razzing them as well, right? Two tribal cops were also there. I guess they were there for security. For whose security? I don't know. But they walked with our team too. So we walked through the front and into the loud gym, which immediately went silent. Absolutely quiet. My fellow tribal members saw me and they all stopped cheering, talking, and moving. Yeah, they think he's a, he's a, a traitor. I think they stopped breathing. And then, as one, they all turned their backs on me. This is huge. So the whole team, all at the same time, turned their backs on Arnold. So again, a pretty huge statement um, saying, you know, calling him a traitor, that they want nothing to do with him, that they, you know, feel like he has deserted them to play with the white kids. It was a freaking awesome display of contempt or hatred. I was impressed. So were my teammates, especially Roger. He just looked at me and whistled. I was mad. If these dang Indians had been this organized when I went to school here, maybe I would have had more reasons to stay. That thought made me laugh. So I laughed. And my laughter was the only sound in the gym. And then I noticed that the only Indian who hadn't turned his back on me was Rowdy. He was standing on the other end of the court. He passed a basketball around his back, around his back, around his back, like a clock, and he glared at me. So here we have some strategy, right? They're trying to be intimidating to these Reardon, uh, these Reardon kids. He wanted to play. He didn't want to turn his back on me. He wanted, uh, he wanted to kill me face to face. That made me laugh some more. <clears throat> and then coach started laughing with me and so did my teammates. So this is an important move too. The uh, well Pettit team is trying very hard to intimidate them and they're just laughing back. <clears throat> and we kept laughing as we walked into the locker room to get ready for the game. Once inside the locker room, I almost passed out. I slumped against a locker. I felt dizzy and weak. And then I cried and felt ashamed of my tears. But coach knew exactly what to say. It's okay, coach said to me, but he was talking to the whole team. If you care about something enough, it's going to make you cry, but you have to use it. Use your tears, use your pain, use your fear. Get mad, Arnold. Get mad. And so I got mad. And I was still mad and crying when we ran out for warm ups. And I was still mad when the game started. I was on the bench. I didn't think I was going to play much. I was only a freshman, like grade niner. But halfway through the first quarter, with the score tied at 10, coach sent me in. And as I ran into the court, somebody in the crowd threw a quarter at me and hit me in the frickin' forehead. They drew blood. I, I was bleeding, so I couldn't play. Bleeding and angry, I glared at the crowd. They taunted me as I walked into the locker room. I bled alone until Eugene, my dad's best friend, remember the guy that dropped him off at the school on the Indian uh, motorbike? Walked in. He had just become an EMT for the tribal clinic. Let me look at that like an emergency trained person, like kind of like a, a paramedic. Let me look at that, he said, and poked at my wound. You still got your motorcycle, I asked. Nah, I wrecked that thing, he said, and dabbed antiseptic on my cut. How does this feel? It hurts. 
Ah, it's nothing, he said. Maybe three stitches. I'll drive you to Spokane to get it fixed up. Do you hate me too? I asked Eugene. Nah, man, you're cool, he said. Good, I said. It's too bad you didn't get to play, Eugene said. Your dad says you're getting pretty good. Not as good as you, I said. Eugene was a legend. People say he could have played in college, but people also say Eugene couldn't read. You can't read, you can't ball. So here is the message coming through from the author, right? Sherman Alexi about the importance of our Indigenous people getting literacy skills. <clears throat> um, this Indigenous author, Sherman Alexi, believes that reading and education is the ticket to a better life, right? You'll get them next time, Eugene said. You stitch me up? I said, what? You stitch me up. I want to play tonight. I can't do that, man. It's your face. I might leave a scar or something. Then I'll look tougher, I said. Come on, man. So Eugene did it. He gave me three stitches in my forehead, and it hurt like crazy. But I was ready to play the second half. This is pretty impressive, right? Pretty darn impressive. We were down by five points. Rowdy had been an absolute terror, scoring 20 points, grabbing 10 rebounds, and stealing the ball seven times. That kid is good, coach said. He's my best friend, I said. Well, he used to be my best friend. What is he now? I don't know. We scored the first five points of the third quarter, and then coach sent me into the game. I immediately stole a pass and drove for a layup. Rowdy was right behind me. I jumped into the air, heard the curses of 200 Spokans, and then saw only a bright light as Rowdy smashed his elbow into my head and knocked me unconscious. Okay, let's put this into, into context here, into perspective. Rowdy knows that Arnold's head is really, really fragile, right? Remember at the beginning of the book, Arnold or Jr. explains that he was born with, with a condition called hydrocephalus, which is water on the brain. He has a really fragile brain. So the fact that Rowdy elbowed him in the head, it's dirty, it's dirty play. Okay, I don't remember anything else from that night. So everything I tell you now is secondhand information. After, uh, sorry, after Rowdy knocked me out, both of our teams got into a series of shoving matches and push fights. The tribal cops had to pull 20 or 30 adult Spokans off the court before any of them assaulted a teenage white kid. Rowdy was given a technical foul. So we shot two free throws for that. Now, I didn't shoot them, of course, because I was already in Eugene's ambulance with my mother and father on the way to Spokane. After we shot the technical free throws, the two referees huddled. They were two white dudes from Spokane who were absolutely terrified of the wild Indians in the crowd and were willing to do anything to make them happy. So they called technical fouls on four of our players for leaving the bench and on coach for unsportsmanlike conduct. Yep, five technicals. 10 free throws. After Rowdy hit the first three, uh, the first six free throws, so um, coach cursed and screamed and then was thrown out of the game. Well, Pennant actually ended up winning by 30 points. I ended up with a minor concussion. He's lucky because with his fragile head, that could have turned out a lot worse, right? Yep, three stitches and a bruised brain. My mother was just beside herself with worry, I'm sure. She thought I'd been murdered. Can you imagine murdered by his best friend? Whew, not good. I'm okay, I said, just a little dizzy. But you're hydrocephalus, she said. Your brain is already damaged enough. Gee, thanks, Mom, I said. Of course, I was worried that I'd further damage my already damaged brain. The doctors said I was fine. Mm, mostly fine. Later that night, Coach talked his way past the nurses and into my room. My mother and father and grandma were asleep in their chairs, but I was awake. Hey, kid, Coach said. K 
keeping his voice low so he wouldn't make my family. Hey, coach, I said. Sorry about the game, he said. It's not your fault. I should have played you. I should have can't. I shouldn't have played you. Sorry. I should have canceled the whole game. It's my fault. So check out this coach. He is a really caring person. I wanted to play. I wanted to win. It's just a game, he said. It's not worth all this. But he was lying. He was just saying what he thought he was supposed to say. Of course, it was not just a game. Every game is important. Every game is serious. Coach, I said, I would walk out of this hospital and walk all the way back to Well Pennant to play them right now if I could. Coach smiled. Vince Lombardi used to say something like that, he said. It's not whether you win or lose, I said. It's how you play the game. No, but I like that one, Coach said. But Lombardi didn't mean it. Of course, it's better to win. We laughed. No, I like this other one more, Coach said. And he has a different quote. The quality of a man's life is in direct proportion to his commitment to excellence, regardless of his chosen field of endeavor. So in other words, the, you get the, the more you put in, the more you put out. So coach likes that one better. That's a good one. It's perfect for you. I've never met anybody as committed as you. Thanks, coach. You're welcome. Okay, kid, you take care of your head. I'm going to get out of here so you can sleep. Oh, I'm not supposed to sleep. They want me awake to monitor my head and make sure I don't have some hidden damage or something. Oh, okay, coach said. Well, how about I stay and keep you company then? Check out this coach. He not just is acting caring, but he is caring. Now, a couple of the, of the other teachers are going to um, act like they're a bit racist um, in the book. But this coach definitely is not. He is, he is a, a real, true, genuine, caring person. Wow. Uh, that would be great. So Coach and I sat awake all night. We told each other many stories, but I never repeat those stories. That night belongs to just me and my coach. Check that out. The coach stayed all night and stayed awake all night because he cared about that kid so much. Wow. Really good character delineation of the coach. He is not just, you know, a coach for the paycheck. He is a coach because he cares and he proves it definitely in this uh, in this last bit here. Um, all right, so that's the end of our section. Um, and uh, remember that you are to answer the questions in your study package in preparation for the quiz that will be coming shortly.